Okay, so lesson three, like the first lesson we learned to make Pong, the second lesson you made a state machine and you kind of got a better understanding of scopes and how you can use if statements to structure your things and also how you can use methods to to uh, to kind of put things into different scopes. Um, before we go into programming a new and extended version of Pong, there's two elements I want to introduce that are really important for you to understand now to be able to later on understand how to use classes and objects and stuff like that. Or at least one element that's important and another one that's just fun because you want to be able to use the keyboard and make key presses as well and not just the mouse as soon as you get into more advanced games. So we just want to cover these two things now. So we need to do for loops and we need to do key presses now because when you understand that, then it's easier for us to move on to the uh, object-oriented programming later on and make some classes with our, uh, our code. So um, the first concept I want to do is uh, actually the for loop. And the for loop hints at some a strategy that is much later on becomes very, 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 very important for you, which is that one thing you have to understand as a programmer is if you're writing the same code over and over and over and again, and you will do that as a beginner, you will write the same, very much the same code, uh, just with tiny differences, then it's usually a sign of you not doing it right. You're not doing, you're not, you're not using the computer with its full potential. You're kind of making manual labor where you could you have a computer do the work for you. And one of the ways to kind of solve this is the for loop. The for loop is basically, I have to do the same thing, a similar thing over and over and again, again with the same logic in it. And I wanted to make sure instead of just copy paste the code many times, I want to kind of run through it and do it. So let's say in one simple example, which is what I want to do now, which is, let's say we have our punk game. And if we look in our punk game, I have it somewhere here, then, um, one thing that is in the classic punk game, there's like a ball court. So there's like a tennis, what do you call it, like a, a net, like between here. Like there's like these dotted lines here. You start the game and then there's a dotted line going down here. Do, 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 do. And of course, I can do this by just making, drawing, like writing 20 rectangles or 50 or how many I need. But it would be it would be quite a, a lot of repetition of code because the only difference is the positions of each re rectangle. So I want to kind of show you how for loops can help you optimize in that sense. So let's start with the kind of the the kind of not so smart way of doing it. And since we're just working with the net, nothing else, we can just write it in the the setup because we're not going to do any animations, any anim uh, stuff like that. We're not going to do live stuff here. Just, we're just going to kind of make the ball court. So now we have a size. It's a, we set it to 300 times 400 or something. And then we have a background zero. And then we want to, so now we just have a black screen coming up when we press play, nothing else. And then we want to draw the net. That's the only thing we want to work with here. And that is a wrong format. So let's just switch it. So it's 400 times 300. It's more like Pong Pong Classic Pong. Yes, there it is. Good. So this guy here is now, we now want to make the net in the middle. So what I can do is, of course, to say rectangle, and then I can place it in the, somewhat in the middle. It's not going to be perfectly in the middle, but it's good enough for now. So you can say width divided by two, and then I can say, all right, I want it 20 high, and then uh, 20 down, and then I want it 20 uh, uh, 10 width and 20 height, for an example. Then I get like this little guy here. There. That's the little guy. So we're starting to work on it. And if you don't know, these, this is the X position. This is the Y position. This is the uh, high, uh, width of the object. And this is the height of the object. So if I want a lot of these dots, I can just keep on doing this. And they, all right, the next one should be at 30. And then we have two dots. And then, you know, you can just go on like that. Oh, that was wrong. Uh, yes, I'm messing up. This is the guy I want to play with and it should be 50, something like that. Then there's 10 between them or something. If the height is 20. So 10, 50, yeah, that should be right. So now it looks like that. 
And of course I can move on like this, add another 30 to it, so we are 180. And what you realize now is I'm actually writing the same code over and over and over and over and over again. And this is not the perfect way to program. And later on, you're going to learn how to do objects and classes and stuff like that. And there you really, really, you really get to use the power of for loops. So I want to show you how for loops work. So first of all, I'm going to comment this out. I'm just going to do it like this. So I say slash star, and that means uncomment everything that's here, ignore this stuff that comes after this until this one appears. So this stuff is now commented out, so it's not there, because we need some of it later. So the trick with a for loop, and the syntax looks like this. Um, so what I'm doing here is actually saying, there's three parameters I'm working with here. And they are and it takes a while to kind of get this, but this, these are the three parameters we actually have in a for loop that we can kind of define in a for loop. So it says we have a counter, we create a, a variable called counter. This counter is only available inside the scope and we start out with zero. Then we set the counter, say counter should always be less than 20. And for each time we run what's inside the scope, we add one more to the counter. So this one is just counting Inside here is just counting 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way up to 19, because when it hits 20, it's not longer less than 20, because 20 is equal to 20, then it will stop, it will jump out of this scope and this for loop and just run whatever comes after. So let me just put it on one line, because to understand the scope, it's easier to have it on one line like this. So this for loop here, is another command like this one up here. This is a method or function that has a scope. Inside this we have a for loop and it has a scope and this is the scope for the for loop and this scope is run 20 times because it's from 0 to 19 and that is um, 20. So if I write counter here you will see that it will just loop this 20 times, do it over and over again and then it will print out what the value for counter is. So the counter will um, will show up down here in the debug prompt as, uh, as it will start at 0 and then it will run all the way down to 19 and then it will stop. So now we have something that actually have written a lot of uh, numbers out here. If we should do the same ma thing manually it would look something like this 0 print ln 1 print ln 2 and a lot more and then in the end it will be print ln 19. So instead of doing this, right now we have some code that does it for us. So we only have to write this many lines of code. And then you can say, hey, this is like four lines of code and 20 lines of code is not that much. But think about it, if you want to do 10,000, is that 10,000? 10, 10,000 of these guys, then suddenly it becomes very important not to have to write 10,000 lines to write it out, but instead just have a, a four or five lines of code. Let's start with 20. So uh, this we can use to an ad advantage because we have a counter and it gives us a number for each loop. So we know in what number of the cycle we're in. And remember counter is just something I made up. We could call it Hugo and it will work just as fine as long as we call everything Hugo. Hugo, Hugo, this is just as good. It's just counter is the most intuitive word I can come up with right now. A lot of people use i because it's an index and it's very common to see i here. So you will see a lot of these with an i here. For a beginner I feel like it's it becomes very compressed and it's so hard to kind of notice that this is an i all the way through so I like to do counter but in reality it's exactly the same. And also be aware so we have three of these. We have counter starts at zero, should never be more than uh, should never should always be less than 20 and here we says counter equals counter plus one so we say whatever the counter was last time add one to that and put it into the counter whatever counter was last time add one to it and put it into the counter so if we say two here we're actually jumping like so it's like zero two four six eight and so forth so now we are getting a, a, a only a, a even numbers it's rare that you want to do that. 
99% of the time you just want to say plus one and then do the math down here instead because we can do something similar to it by saying twice as times two and start at uh, only do 10. So that would give us the same because we only go to 10 and then we double up here. So this, th that would be a more healthy strategy. And that's what we're going to use now because we have a lot of wrecks we want to draw at some point. So here's the first one. So now I'm going to draw this uh, rect here and I'm just going to remove the old crap here because we don't need it anymore. So now we have this kind of the essence of the code. And when I run this, it actually draws 20 rectangles on the screen, right there on the, on, on the screen. And then the problem is that they're all on top of each other. They're not, I mean, they're just drawing on top of and top and top and top, top like stacked to get on top of each other. So it's not that interesting. We need to move it for each time we draw a rectangle. We want to move it one step at a time. So to do this, we need to go in here and then we need to say, all right, so this is the width position, like how fine it is. That's fine. Actually, we should say minus 10 because, uh, no, minus 5, I think, to have it smack in the middle. Right now it's off a little bit because it draws from the corner here, so it has to move a little bit. But that's the detail. And then we have the height, and the height is what we want to change. We want to change the height all the way down to get this net kind of effect. To do this, we need to change this. So for the first run, it's fine. It should be this. But the next one, we want to kind of increase it to kind of move it along a little bit. And um, to do so, we actually need to say how many jumps do we want to do. And we actually want to do 30 because it's 20 high and I want 10 spacing in between. So it should be something about 30, but 30 only moves it a little bit down. But then as soon as I say times counter, then the first one will be zero. So that will be zero times 30, that will be zero. So the first rectangle will be up here. The next one will be one. That means it will be 30 because 30 times one equals 30 and then it will be here. Next will be two times 30, so that will be 60 and so forth and so forth. And what we have done here is actually making a net for our Pong game. And it's just doing it 20 times, so it might be down here doing lots of stuff down here. I didn't do the math to make sure how many. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 is actually the right number. And of course we can actually do uh, tricky stuff like saying height divided by 30. So we say each of these are 30 and then the amount of times we have to do it is the height divided by 30. And when we do that then we will get exactly the amount needed to draw it on the screen and nothing more than that. Plus minus some off numbers maybe, I don't know. No, I think it's right. Good. So now we have our net. That's it. That's a for loop. That's what a for loop does. And it's very magical in the beginning. At some point you will start to understand this is your friend. This is one of your best friends in programming when you do lots of objects and classes because you can run through it really quickly and in that sense do it really fast. So if I just go back to our Pong game then I can add this to our game and then the question is where should we draw the net? We could draw it here then it would be on every state. That would be weird. So it's the game screen, it's when you play the game you want it. And here in the game screen we have a background zero that clears the screen. So let's just put it here, then it's kind of right after the background. So it's, it's just drawn uh, right after the background. And because I'm using width and height for my math, then if I didn't do something really stupid, then it should actually work perfectly fine. So now we have kind of a game screen line there. So let's uh, we'll wait on saving it because we need to do one more thing. Awesome. So that's one concept that's really important to understand, especially when we move on to classes and objects. Then there's another concept I need to kind of introduce to you guys. And that is how to do, um, how to use key press because when we play the pong game at some point we want to use the keys to kind of move up and down instead of using move around instead of using uh, the mouse and we can just as well kind of have a whole section about that so i'm going to do that now so the way processing works is actually there's multiple ways to access a key press but what you have to understand is this difference between event and event and then uh, and a state so what we want is the event 
of one pressing down the key and the event of letting go of the key. So that's an event. The state is, is the key up or down. And that's very important because in reality what we want is as long as the state is down, we actually want to move forward and as soon as you let go, you want it to stop moving down or for, uh, forward for an example. So let's make a simple uh, kind of object that can move forward. So we say post x equals, um, uh, actually we want to do up and down right now because we are, um, we are um, we're doing the bad thing and that's up and down. So let's do that. Um, so here we have a, a kind of a, 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 what do you call it, a float called um, post y. And then we kind of want to build this uh, little bad thing. So we're going to make, we cannot write bad, but we can make a rectangle that kind of creates the illusion of an, a bad. And we put a 20 in. This bad is going to be a little bit floating in the air for some reason. And then we want the width to be 10 and the height to be 30, for example. So now we have a tiny little bad that is drawn on, on position 0, as shown in, in tutorial 1. But instead of using the mouse to move it around, I want to use key presses. So there's a best practice because you can do something like this. If key pressed, that means some key is pressed somewhere and key equals to, and then the key you want to look at is for an example, then you want to say, let's do this then. Then you want to say post y equals post y uh, plus one else um, else if uh, key pressed, that's kind of not cool, so we're gonna do it and structure it properly. So you learned about scopes, so we're gonna be well structured and use our scopes properly. So we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do else if, and then key equals uh, w because it's up, and then we're gonna do post y equals post y minus one. So this actually works. So now you see I don't have my indentations correct, so I write command T to get that right. So now it looks nice. And then I press this one up and down here. So I can actually move it up and down. And this looks like it's working, and it is working. The problem is that it doesn't take into consideration there will be multiple kind of ups and downs, uh, multiple uh, keys at once that has to be handled. This one can only handle one kind of key, key at the time. So it's not a solid solution, and there's a best practice of doing this. Uh, and that's what I want to show you now. So instead of doing this here, we're going to comment this out. We don't want, want it, we want it in later on. But the best practice is actually to do this. Mm -hmm. So we can actually have a write a new method here called key pressed, and notice how it turns yellow. The reason it turns yellow is because this um, this is a special method that the processing will call every time a key is pressed. So it's an event. Like this is a state. It checks is a key pressed right now. This one is an event. It will only call it once when you press the key. And then there's another one called released that looks like this. And when we have these two, we can listen to is a key been pressed down, then just move the bat until a key is released, the same key is released, and stop the bat. And that's what we're going to do here. To do this, we actually have to do something similar to, uh, uh, to what we did uh, with, the, um, with the ball. We have to make a kind of an automated animation here. So we say speed y, oh, uh, sorry, post y plus speed y. So what we do here, every frame move the, uh, the bat uh, whatever is inside speed y, add that to the to the to the bat. So post y plus y, put that into post y. So right now it's zero, so nothing will happen. It will not do anything. But then we can kind of change the speed y down in key pressed, and then something will happen. I will just remove this. If we don't need it. So here in key pressed, we can say if, and now we know that a key has just been pressed, else we wouldn't be here. If key equals and then notice I use I did the same thing up here. I just forgot to tell you, but I'm using single kind of um, plings here, and that's because it's a character we're checking on, not um, um, a string. If it was a string, we would use the double one. So since it's just a character, we're going to do this, 
And then we're gonna say, um, so this is downward, so that's adding something. And then we're just gonna say speed y equals speed y, uh, no, uh, equals uh, one. So we want to add one every time that we go this. And now I made an error and it's actually showing me the error. Sometimes it doesn't. And what is the error is I have to use two times equal here because this one sets it, it says speed y to one, whereas this one says key, if key is the same as this, then do this inside this group. Great. And we do the same thing with uh, w, boop, boop, and say, and this one, this one we want to go in the opposite direction. So we want to go up, and since the, 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 what do you call it, the, um, the, the, the system, the coordinate system is, is, is reversed from what we're used to in math. So it goes down, we have to uh, say minus here. So it, it, minus one every time. And then, so this guy here is gonna go up and down. When I press um, W, let's see if you wanna start. Uh, press S, it moves down. But when I release the key, now I'm not touching it. It's still moving down. Then I can press W and moving up. But I also want it to stop when I let go of the key. And that's where key release comes in. So I basically do the same thing. Um, except now I set it to zero. So the speed is zero, which means it's not moving. Mm. Boom. If key equals equals to W then set speed y to zero. So these two are basically the same, so we could combine them into one by making an or here with the pipes that you learned from the earlier lesson, and then put that in here, and then we don't know, need this if statement. So that would be the same. And now we have kind of a simple key up and down, where when, as soon as I release the key, it will stop, and when I press it again, it will start. So it's kind of like, it works as a kind of controlled interface. And what this enables us to do is actually to make the other axis as well. So we can make the X axis as well. Let's do that. So now we have a pose X, and then we need this one. I'm just gonna write it, plus speed X. And then here we need to kind of have the keys for that. So I'm just gonna copy paste it because it's pretty much the same. I would advise you not to copy paste though because when you copy paste, you have a tendency to lose track of what I just did. So let's see, what did I do wrong? There it is. So this one should be A and it should be minus and this one should be D and it should be positive because that's the directions. And then we cannot make more ors here because it's the other axis. So we have to say A or D, and then we have to say zero on the x-axis. So this enables us to kind of have a little kind of bat that actually moves around in the full space. So this is not working. Why is it not working? It's not working because, yeah, that was the copy paste, paste thing I was talking about. It's actually, be very careful with copy and paste because it does tend to confuse even me. So let's see if that works. Yeah, so when I press D, it moves in that direction, A in that direction, S in that direction, and W in that direction. And because we're using this pattern, we get, we get an added benefit that is if I press S and D at the same time, it's actually going in kind of a, a 45 degree angle. I can do that all the way around. So now we can also go go on corners with it. And that's what is kind of cool with this one. All right, so this is the basics of key pressed. And now being done with this, we can start to kind of play around with more advanced stuff. Oh, we need to kind of add it to the pong game as well. Let's do that. So our pong game has a um, mouse Y, mouse Y. And there should also be a mouse Y in the rectangle here. So we need to kind of add this stuff to it. So first of all, the key press need to kind of go in here. Yeah. And then maybe we already have a speed Y, pose X, pose Y. These pose X and pose Y are actually for the... 
ball and we use deer here that's the same as speed so there's some concepts here that is colliding and before I kind of copy it over I want to make sure I'm cleaning it up a little bit so I'm gonna say instead of post y I'm gonna say bad y and bad x and then I'm gonna say bad speed y and bad and then because we're using direction instead of speed it's just a word so I'm gonna use direction here as well so now the concept are matching more probably. Bad, 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 and this is where search and replace might have been faster, but we're just gonna keep on doing it. Bad direction, because I wanna make sure that it's the direction of the bad and not the direction of the ball. Bad Y. Bad Y. Oh, I'm doing something wrong. It has to be bad direction. Bad deer Y. Bad deer X. Bad deer Y. Bad deer X. All right. So now it's still compiling. You can see there is no errors, and I can probably run it, and it will be fine. So the only difference I've done is just to clean up the code so it's easy to copy over without getting into too much trouble, too much collisions. Good, so to kind of merge these two together, we actually have to be aware that we cannot just, we have only to merge the things that are relevant. So size and background and stuff like that that's written in here is not necessary to copy over, but we need this stuff here is important. So we're going to add that to our Pong game, and then the key pressed, we just want to put in key released, we just want to put in the bottom of the game thing. And then we have these two guys here, and those are important somewhere inside the rectangle here, something around the bat would be a wise place to put it. And then we want the bad to be bad x and bad y instead of mouse x and y because now we're using the keys. And then there's the collision detection with the bad. And that should then use the bad y and the bad x. No, bad y. So instead of mouse y, we're using bad y instead. All right, so. This is where you cross your fingers and hope for the best and hope that you got it right and else you have to tumble around in the code and figure out what you did wrong. I'm quite sure it will work just fine. It will be a little bit weird because now we can move in all directions without bad, but actually that is a part of the original Pong game. You could actually do this, so it's not totally wrong. I think you are not allowed to cross it. Oh, there's no collision. Ah! I cannot catch it. Ooh. Let's see if the collision works. Ooh. Oh, it collided behind the bat. That's another <laughs> bug that we haven't seen before because we have never had the bat outside the, the scope here. Let's see. Oh, it moved through it. That's not good. So we have a bug somewhere. We have to figure out why is it not colliding. Let's see. All right, so at least one problem is we have post y is bigger than bad y, and we have post y is less than bad y plus 60. That's correct, but we actually need to add the other dimension now. Now we have the x dimension. So the x dimension has to be, and this is not perfect, this is just a simple solution right now because this is not the core of what we are talking about. So if you have position x, I'll go into depth about a little bit more of collision detection later. So right now I just want to make sure that the post x, the position of the ball, if that one is less than the bat position, that means the ball is behind the bat, then it should bounce. And it's not going to be perfect, it's not going to be pretty. I can show you the error in a second, but let's just try it and see if that's enough to catch some of it. I'm not sure actually. Might be stuck here. It might be one of those where you have to actually think and figure it out slowly. Mm -mm -mm. Nope, that was not enough. Bad mist. 
bad mist. So that one is correct. So bad mist is actually, we have to also separate this, but I'm surprised that it, uh, with height, I will just double check that I didn't do something stupid with the bad x, y, dash is correct. Uh, less than is the position of the ball is less than the bat. Oh, but that's uh, no, that's actually something. Ah, okay, that's why. Okay, now I get it. So actually, I'm doing something wrong here because the the, the structure of of our um, of our code now is actually different, so there has to be another scope to it. So we have to solve this by separating these two. And now that is where the if statements kind of goes into havoc here. So we have to make sure that we are um, actually cleaning this up a little bit. Yeah, so there's quite a lot that has to be cleaned up here to make it... So the scores have to... It has to be two separate instances. Instead of a collective instance with two scenarios, it has to be one scenario is we hit the bat, the other scenario is that we actually outside the screen, which means that we fail to hit it. So we have to separate these two into two different ones. And then the score has to be moved inside here. So the, in the scenario of the score being more than two, go to state two. If the scenario is less than, that means we have missed a lot of times, then go to state three. Let's see if that's enough, if, or if I still miss something important. I cannot guarantee it, but uh, let's see. So we can use the key presses to move our bat around. So the ball is that is correct. Oh, maybe I'm actually failing here. Yeah, so now it's bouncing, but there will be another error, which is a scenario we haven't looked into yet, which is if it's behind here, if the ball is behind, it will bounce weirdly like that. So that's that's not right. So right now it will win all the time when it's behind the bat. So we need to make another rule here saying, yeah, yeah, and there's a width of the bat. Right now it, the logic collision detection is for this whole area here. So we need kind of to have the width of the bat as a part of the rule as well. That's something you can play with. That's not uh, important right now. I just wanted to round it off and give you uh, both the key pressed to move the bat around. And then I wanted to give you the, the net so we have that for loop concept as well. And that's where this tutorial ends and we move on to the next ones which are going to be classes and objects.